1962, Rachel Carson was credited with the birth of the environmental movement in her epic work called Silent Spring, which took a look at the effects of DDT, a pesticide, on the population of birds around the world. This last unit is going to take a look at the biochemistry and the environment and some of her work. Let's begin with the definition of what are called xenobiotics. They're basically compounds found in organisms that are foreign to that organism. They could come from a host of places. One of those could be pharmaceuticals, drugs perhaps that were left over in your medicine cabinet have been washed down the sink, hormones and antibiotics that have been administered to cattle and poultry that have ended up in our diet. Those materials are foreign to the environment and unable to be broken down. Pollutants, here's one, dioxin, that was produced back in the 1960s and 70s, is found in the effluent of pulp and paper mills, the byproduct of the process. And here, some 30, 40, 50 years later, the chemical still persists, unable to be broken down by microorganisms in our environment. A particular concern is the carbon-chlorine bond, which just doesn't tend to be broken down. Insecticides and herbicides, as I mentioned earlier, this was the work of Rachel Carson, who took a look in particular at DDT and its use as an insecticide. Plastics have found their way through our environment. Any one traveling in the oceans, you can see tons of plastics that essentially pool in places. And a particular concern are microspherulites. These materials have been added to deodorants and toothpaste, small microparticles of plastic that essentially are unseen by the eye, but are certainly persistent in our environment. Heavy metals, which are present in a lot of batteries, mercury, cadmium, lead, these have been found to disrupt tertiary and quaternary structure in proteins. One of the concerns about xenobiotics is their ability to concentrate in higher level organisms. Let's take a look at the work of Rachel Carson. She was able to go through the story of the development of DDT, which was used to essentially control mosquito populations and initially highly effective in its use. But it was later discovered that DDT that essentially wasn't used to kill the mosquitoes that was widespread would pool in bodies of water. There it would be consumed by zooplankton, although in very low concentrations. Fish that would feed on that zooplankton would selectively absorb it. DDT is fat soluble and as a result would concentrate in the fat tissues of the fish. Organisms which then in turn consume the fish, birds of prey in this case, eagles, would essentially then continue to concentrate the DDT in their fat tissue, essentially now consuming all of the uh, all of the pollutant, all of the DDT now that was present in the zooplankton has now been concentrated in one organism, the bald eagle. Any top predator would suffer from this effect. Some of the things we might do to ameliorate or, or lessen the effects of these xenobiotics, one of them is host-guest chemistry. We can synthesize molecules that mimic the structure of enzymes and thereby induce our xenobiotic to combine with them. So these xenobiotics, which would be called the guest, would combine with our host molecule and form what's called a host-guest complex. That host-guest complex could then be removed and incinerated or taken to a separate container where we could reverse the process and release our guest and essentially uh, utilize it in another manner. Forces that hold this guest-host complex together would include some of our weak interactions that we saw in tertiary structure. They would include hydrogen bonding, the London dispersion force, or hydrophobic interactions, and interactions like ionic bonds as well. We can also make the choices to use biodegradable substances. For instance, cornstarch has found its way into a lot, replacing a lot of plastics. Here's an example of cornstarch packaging, which replaced the styrofoam beads of the past. If we can replace plastics that have aromatic structures in them with aliphatic or linear structures, we make a substance that's more easily broken down in our environment, because the aromatic ring is somewhat foreign to many organisms. Here's an example of, coming, of a plastic coming from lactic acid, forming polylactic acid, a linear molecule without the aromatic rings. 
It's also, I'm going to mention at this point a little bit about detergents. On the, on the left hand side, I have what are called ABS plastics. They have branched hydrocarbons, which are notoriously difficult for microorganisms to break down. The removal of those branched hydrocarbons makes a linear molecule, which again is much easier to break down. Some experiments have involved the use to existing plastics of cobalt because cobalt can help catalyze the degradation or breakdown of plastics as well. Bioremediation is an interesting use of microorganisms to treat industrial waste. In this case, uh, an oil spill is being sprayed with a microorganism which essentially uses the oil as a food substrate and turning it into carbon dioxide and water. We also can make the use of enzymes to break and clean down industrial waste, but also fats and greases that accumulate on our clothes. There's a lot of interest now in the use of enzymes, especially those that can withstand uh, temperature ranges of 30 to 50 degrees Celsius in our washing machines to help break down foods and greases that might deposit themselves there. And lastly, we can look at the use of a concept of green chemistry and in particular something called the atom economy which is we look at an industrial process and evaluate its efficiency and here's what I mean by that let's look at two processes that are manufacturing a product um, that we want substance C in case number one I mix molecule A with molecule B I'm not going to use any solvents or catalysts in this particular process and my efficiency then would be the mass of substance C over the mass of my reactants. Now if I use the exact stoichiometric amounts of my reactants, this process would almost be 100% efficient. In my second process, I'm reacting A with substance E to make substance C my target and a byproduct D. That byproduct D re reduces the efficiency of my process and it wouldn't be considered as green a process. So A would be a superior choice to develop. I've enjoyed making this series to help you along with the IB program. I wish you good luck in the future and thanks again for watching.